the Thoughty OT podcast. I wasn't really diagnosed. Like, I'm dyslexic. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I found that out after high... No, um, the first year of college. So I'd gone mm-hmm. through exams. I'd gone through all that stress. And then after that, um, you do like... What is it? It's like a standardised um, learning difficulty test or something like that it's like just a yeah. standardized test you do it every beginning of the year to see if you've got learning difficulties and mm-hmm. they were like i i finished it and probably around five minutes it was meant to take like 15 mm-hmm. and i was just like <laughs> yeah that that this one this one done and um then the the, the teacher comes around and then they're like all right callum um you, you, you're gonna have to take that again and i'm like all right mm-hmm. why and then they stay with me the entire time, and I and I, this time I proper go through it, and then they're like, "I'm like, all oh, right, yeah." So so I scored like an an eighty. Is that good? And then they're like, "No, it means that you probably um, <laughs> have some learning difficulties." And then I went into college, and they gave me a proper thing, and I found out I was dyslexic. And weirdly, it was like how I see it is like a very micro miniature version of how FMA said, because I hated mm-hmm. school. I always hated school and education, all that stuff. I just despised it. And when I look, it's very visual, isn't it? Oh yeah. Especially like a and like when school I look with back, the whiteboards and the blackboards mm-hmm. and stuff. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's like when I look back on it, cause what dyslexia has done to me is that if you give me a set of instructions right now, my brain will manage to flip them by the time you've I'd like I it comes for me to do it. So if you gave me like mm-hmm. the instructions to get to the shop and I was like, okay, so it's it, it's a left, then a right, I will go right and then left yeah. and then get completely yeah. lost. And um that's so it's kind like of, like having a mirror, yeah. a mirror in your brain. Like Yeah, pretty much. And that kind of was my experience of school. So I was in like bottom set for everything with all like the bad kids mm-hmm. and you know the people with undiagnosed learning difficulties and the diagnosed learning difficulties and people just thought I was stupid to be honest mm-hmm. and like I said before I had like major confidence issues so that didn't help pretty much I was in a- it's, it, it can be very destructive can't it because oh yeah it is you know school as you, as you said the sets they kind of divide you into different learning groups yeah. and you automatically you know assign assign people as smarter when they're when they're higher up in the sets yeah but when you when you have a learning um difficulty it kind of puts a little bit of a block between you and the information that comes in yeah um my uh one of my family members um very 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 smart individual um i was has a lot of potential was really really crushed by their experience with being dyslexic they took it like a, as a very very personal thing it's like i don't have dyslexia it's not it's not something that re- requires a lot of attention it's just that i'm stupid and i can't do this and i can't yeah. do that and the the thing is is that they they are actually very very intelligent very very good at uh, socializing very very yeah talented i would say and it's kind of that experience of the, them at school really really made sort of um their confidence levels very 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 low oh yeah it ends up mm-hmm. um like for me it became because alongside that i was bullied and i had like a really abusive step Mm -hmm. parent when i was a kid and it just kept mounting was like all of this stuff where it was literally beating me down at an incredibly formative point in my life i'd say yeah and it led to me viewing the world in an extremely dangerous way so Mm -hmm. i became because because the nuts thing is is like I completely, well, FMA is my dad, so I relate to him Yeah. Um, yeah. in a weird way. Not even in a weird way, he's my dad, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> of course. Of course, well, of I course relate you're to him. He's, he's my relation. <laughs> um, yes, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 
when I first on TV, when I saw people have relationships, like having a girlfriend and Mm -hmm. having alcohol and having these things that instantly made those characters happy, just instant. Yeah, yeah. Like there was no sort of build up. There wasn't any self improvement. There wasn't looking in yourself. It was, I have a beer. I'm good now. (laughs) And I became incredibly obsessed with a ton of things at an age that I shouldn't have been obsessed with them at Mm -hmm. all. So it's like I have vivid memories of being like really young and putting my mum's wine in like a Ribena bottle and going into primary school with that. And stuff like that. Not enough that I'd be drunk, but in my head it was like, that's the thing that makes me feel good. And these things kept developing and I kept like through the way that school kind of isolates you when you have learning difficulties of just keeping you Mm -hmm. kind of in the bottom set and just keeping you away from like all these other kids. And you're in probably the class with a lot of people who have issues and who Mm -hmm. maybe aren't the nicest people through no fault of their own, but you're in those classes, and it just kept reinforcing this behavior until the point when I had to, literally, my mum said that I couldn't live with her anymore, and I needed to go and live with FMA, and that was where music started. But the only thing that was the connective throughout all of that was rap and writing lyrics, and that mm-hmm, was like mm-hmm. the only thing I became like hyper obsessed with that, like listening to like. Why do you why mm. do you think you gravitated towards rap music? Like why not sort of mainstream pop? Why not metal? Why not why not reggae? Um, like I think what it genuinely was, um, looking back on it, was metal was angry, and I've always liked yeah. metal, but. Rap, there were like two major things. One, there was the confidence of it, yes, and the yeah. confidence that they were talking about all of these like systemic racist, messed up lives that they had lived, mm. and they were now in a position where they were telling you that they are the best thing on the planet. They are that confident, and they've gone through yeah so much crap, and pretty much the next thing that I just really liked about it was I think it at a point in my life where I felt extremely lonely and isolated in school and by a supposed friend group that I had at that time where I was the punching bag of that friend group um I relate (laughs) yep yep (laughs) and it's it's also weird isn't it because you don't clock onto it until you look back no. at it when you're a kid it's like oh yeah they're, 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 these are my friends these are who i go and hang around at lunch and then when you look it's like you don't have the the, the ability yeah. to be serious about anything like yeah to take anything personally because you just like oh well this must be what life is like and yeah you know there's nothing wrong with this because this is all i know and yeah yeah and you just kind of eventually like looking back i think you just clock onto the fact of no those weren't jokes. You were all pointedly mm-hmm. joking at me. You weren't making jokes yeah. with me. They were at me. And yeah, so that was like the friend group and stuff. So when I listened to rap and it were these people just being hyper confident and then I'd hear a punchline mm-hmm. and I'd understand that punchline. I felt like the cleverest mm-hmm. person on the planet in yeah. like while I was at school and you know they, they were like bottom set you know you you can't do division or long form multiplication or any of this stuff mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then I was like yeah but I understood the line that DMX just said did you <laughs> and it turned into this whole thing where I genuinely saw when I look back on it I genuinely think that those were my friends mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. rappers who would tell me about their lives and would give me these stories and these positive stories of why not to go to jail and, you know, what to do in these situations and stuff. And I just loved it. And it became, as a kid, it became almost a thing because that same friendship group, when I mentioned I wanted to rap or be a rapper, they were immediately like, oh, you can't do that. 
You, you, yeah. you just can't. One thing that they liked to do was in classes, they would give me random words to rhyme until yeah. I couldn't rhyme a word. And then yeah. they would proceed to then, you know, have a massive thing at me about, see, this is why you can't be a rapper. You need to rhyme words all the time. And then yeah, it so it's literally like yeah. you rhyme and rhyme and rhyme and you do all these, yeah. like you're literally doing what they ask you to yeah. do. But as soon as it comes to a point, yeah. like they just keep going and going. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then of course, at some point you're going to, like anyone's going to yeah. have ish, like difficulties doing that. Yeah, and it, it kept repeating, but that gave me the kind of chip on my shoulder I think I needed. Mm -hmm. to pursue rap like not all of the other horrible things that like my brain became obsessed with but to pursue rap i think that really helped because it literally made rap my only focus mm -hmm. writing was my only focus it was i didn't like school my friends weren't really friends the only thing i had was listening to rap and writing rap and that was it mm -hmm. And then with that same energy, when I came to live with dad, who'd already been in a band, who'd played me rap before and who I knew had done all these things I wanted to do, it was like having personal access to Eminem. Mm -hmm. 